All right, alien franchise nerds, or any sci-fi nerds for that matter, let's have a heart to heart for a second. It's hard to love the Alien movies. I mean, we do love them, but when sciencey plot points don't seem to make any sense, it takes away from the films. And I think this is what's been happening with the franchise for almost the last 40 years, specifically because of the confusing xenomorph life cycle. Let's fix that. Let's piece together every single movie and come up with the definitive xenomorph life cycle. Hopefully. Maybe. First, let me admit that I made a mistake with my previous Alien video. In my first attempt, I didn't get to include Alien Covenant, I didn't really include The Queen, I brushed off the sequels, and I tried to fit everything into the original conception from the original script. That doesn't really make sense. These movies span decades and include the visions of many different writers and directors and producers. So let's try again. Let's start from the beginning and include quotes from the people who actually made these movies to see where the Xenomorph life cycle conclusively ends up from Alien to Covenant. No, just go. There's like, there's like thousands of faces there. Go. You almost done been face hug. Let's start with Alien. The alien mythology has been added to, subtracted from, cut, edited, and trimmed so many times that we need to go back to the original filmmakers and track their intentions chronologically. According to the original script, co-writer Dan O'Bannon said that the xenomorphs were an ancient intelligent species that reproduced via a third party, but had two sexes. In fact, according to executive producer and co-writer Ron Shusett, the xenomorphs would reproduce more or less like this tarantula hawk wasp, which first paralyzes prey like a spider, leaves it to a den, cocoons it, lays an egg near it, and then those eggs hatch and feed off of the spider. However, when the film actually started production, having an ancient species with breeding temples and pyramids was deemed too expensive, and so director Ridley Scott instead merged that idea with the space jockey scene, which was originally just an alien ship without any eggs on it. Dan O'Bannon felt uneasy about this merger because it eliminated a sex, and also made a sensical but complicated xenomorph life cycle more of a surrealist mystery. But we'll get back to that. Making things even more mysterious, a cocooning scene which would complete the wasp-like life cycle was cut. Fans called this the famous egg morphing scene. In this cut scene, it does look like something is happening to the bodies of the Nostromo crew, and some fans have interpreted this as human bodies literally turning into eggs to complete the alien life cycle. Some fans are wrong. According to multiple quotes from director Ridley Scott, the humans are there to be used as food by eggs already laid. Quote, loose on the ship, a new alien begins to lay eggs in the bowels of the ship, and it lives to propagate and must find food for its offspring. In this case, the crew members and the Nostrobo, upon whom the young aliens can feed in their eggs until a new host comes along prodding the eggs. Then the life cycle begins all over again. I know that it looks like something is happening to Brett's body in this scene, but look what's happening to this spider when infected by a parasitoid wasp. Its appearance can change too. So in the original Alien, after all the cuts and the changes, the life cycle was a bit vague. There was no longer an ancient species with two sexes reproducing with each other via a third party, so Ridley Scott made them asexual, and there was no egg laying or cocoon making in the final film, so this is where we're at. A classic xenomorph would lay some eggs with a face hugger that has an embryo inside. A face hugger is more or less just an embryo delivery device. And then that face hugger would find a human host, and then a chest burster would gestate inside that host and then burst out and become a classic xenomorph, which would then repeat the cycle. See? Not so bad. But that egg morphing scene didn't just confuse fans, it confused a director too. According to an interview in 1996, James Cameron thought that audiences wouldn't accept human bodies literally transforming into eggs, even though that's not what happened. And that scene was cut anyway, so Cameron had a chance to officially establish where the eggs came from. 
He didn't think that one single xenomorph could possibly lay all the eggs that we see in the first film, and so sticking with the insect theme, he created the queen. Cameron took much of his inspiration from termite queens, which first find a mate and then a place to rule, and then they begin transforming into egg-laying machines. As the female becomes queen, her abdomen swells exponentially, eventually making her highness here up to a hundred times larger than her subjects. And then she starts laying eggs. One egg every three seconds for 20 years. This can lead to 200 million eggs laid in a lifetime. This would certainly solve Cameron's egg problem, even though it wasn't really a problem in the first place. This is how many xenomorph eggs would have been laid during just this scene. Wait, should I, should I put my face near it? Oh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not a bad scientist, okay, I won't. That wasn't Cameron's only change. According to interviews, it was clear that Cameron interpreted the xenomorphs as taking biological characteristics from the hosts that they use, which would lay the groundwork for hybrids in future films. Hybrids, I should note, that were against the original conception in Alien by executive producer Ron Shusett. Adding everything that James Cameron did are mural morphs. When a classic xenomorph is born, if there is no queen around, it will become a queen, start laying eggs, and then the whole process proceeds as alien established. But if a xenomorph is born and there's already a queen, it will become a male drone. With the idea of alien hybrids now floating around, director of Alien 3, David Lynch, decided to establish it. And as I've said in the previous episode, one way that a xenomorph embryo could take characteristics from its host is through horizontal gene transfer, where cells exchange, don't worry, exchange bits of DNA between them without, without that works, without having to go through the whole sex and reproduction thing. They can exchange genes right away and express them and change the organism. But this seems a bit too nice. If a xenomorph embryo was actively taking DNA from its host, it might work a bit like CRISPR. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, and it's a defense mechanism that bacteria use to destroy the DNA of invading viruses. When a virus invades a bacteria, that bacteria starts cataloging bits of the virus's DNA with its own DNA, and then it sends out that catalog as single strand RNA molecules. Then enzymes in the cell called Cas enzymes pick up these RNA molecules and start floating around the cell. If they encounter any DNA that matches their catalog, they will cut it. They will cut the DNA of the invading virus, inactivating it. We are already trying to use this kind of molecular machinery to revolutionize medicine, but a xenomorph embryo could use more or less the same thing to revolutionize itself. Given the Alien 3 hybrids, let's update the board. Facehugger interaction with a human produces a chestburster, which produces a classic xenomorph, which then leads to everything that we already know. But in Alien 3, it interacts with a dog, which bursts out and then becomes the runner alien. And while we're at it, let's also add Alien vs. Predator and Alien vs. Predator Requiem, because if a facehugger interacts with a predator, it bursts out and becomes a predalien. This, this, is, this is the life cycle so far. But while us nerds were worrying about life cycle stuff, director Ridley Scott was worrying about something else. The space jockey. He wanted to know who that big guy in the suit was. And so we arrive at Prometheus. In Prometheus, also according to this same quote, boop, this quote here, boop, we learn that the eggs, I'm losing it, we learn that the eggs aren't natural. They're bioweapons. If the eggs are bioweapons, that means that they're not natural animals anymore as O'Bannon first envisioned. And now we have a problem. <laughs> Which came first, the xenomorph or the egg? This is a chicken or the egg situation, but in the chicken or the egg situation, the egg comes first. The first genetically true chicken was hatched in an egg that had DNA that combined from two chickens that were not yet genetically true chickens. but. Aliens don't have parents, so this doesn't really apply. Or do they? 
As I said in my first video, this is where the black goo comes in. The goo is a genetic accelerant that takes whatever biology it can find and weaponizes it. But now I think more accurately, it takes biology and turns it into the first stage of a xenomorph so that it can reproduce itself, like a face hugger, or in Prometheus where you see the goo infect a worm and it becomes a hammerpede that face hugs a bad scientist. <sighs> Back to the board. Here is how Zagu interacts with everything in Prometheus and everything else. Okay, okay, okay. Zagu, if it interacts with an engineer and the engineer has too much, he vaporizes and turns into like a, like a, a planet fertilizing goo. If it interacts with a human, if it's too much, it also causes death or turns you into a zombie guy. If the goo interacts with something like sperm, which gets into Shaw, it comes out as a trilobite. The sperm is weaponized, which finds an engineer, face hugs it, comes out as, uh, chest bursts out, but I didn't have space, and then it comes out as the deacon alien. But if it infects maybe a native worm, it also turns it into a first stage, the hammerpede, vagina snake thing. And then if that finds a human who's also a bad scientist, it gets in his mouth, and then it comes out presumably as some Thing. Okay, okay. All right, the last Alien film, except for Alien Resurrection because it doesn't really ch change any. Dang it! Dang it! In Alien Resurrection, the military combines Ripley 8's DNA with the DNA of a queen xenomorph embryo, so. If you combine a queen xenomorph's DNA with human DNA, it get, also gets a womb, I guess, and then it doesn't have to lay eggs anymore. It can just produce a gross human-alien hybrid, which is the newborn. All right. All right, all right. The last Alien movie, Alien Covenant. In Alien Covenant, oh wait, spoiler alert. Turn back now if you don't want any spoilers. Okay, in Alien Covenant, we see even more biological interaction with Zagu. Specifically, we see Zagu interact with some kind of native fungus to produce a spore, which would be the first stage of its life cycle, and it drifts into some human's ear, eventually bursting out and becoming the Neomorph. But more importantly, in the movie, we see the android David messing around with Zagu, these spores, and what look like wasps, just as the original alien intended. How did I get that freeze frame? Don't worry about it. All in order to create the classic face hug. Face hugger. In this way, David is directing how Zagu interacts with organisms and what DNA it has to work with through CRISPR-like or horizontal gene transfer-like processes. David wants the chicken. So how does he get the egg? Dr. Elizabeth Shaw. Through David's dialogue and even his drawings, it's implied, we don't have the same level of evidence that we had for the previous movie, so it's implied that he is using Dr. Shaw's physiology. Her egg cells, she would still have hundreds even if she was infertile at her age, to create a mutated egg that he could place the face hugger that he created in, and thus complete the life cycle of the xenomorph. Time to complete the board! Okay, here we go. Zagu can also interact with fungus and produce spores that when they interact with humans produce the neomorph. But Zagu, when you have David's tinkering, Shaw's egg cells, spores, and native wasps can produce the classic face hugger with an embryo inside, inside of an egg that will interact with a human, chest burst out, only a human, and come out as a classic xenomorph that then proceeds as we've already established. Presumably, a lot of these stages would also go on to have their own queens if aliens still holds in this life cycle. But, this is it. This is the definitive, conclusive xenomorph life cycle. M probably. Maybe. Gaze. G gaze upon its beauty. I, d I did this for you. Because si because science. <sighs> Woo! Make sure to follow me on Twitter at SciFi, where you can suggest ideas for future episodes, and on Instagram, where I'm now posting mini episodes like I did today, also on Facebook. And if you want even more of my silliness, I'm now doing a show called Musquatch! 
with with Dan Casey, my good friend, and it's very silly, and I suggest you watch if you want to. And also, if you want even more space, I have a new show on Alpha called The Space Program. It's kind of like a combination of Cosmos and Mystery Science Theater. So check out Alpha, check out Space Program, check out Muskrat, check out all the other stuff I just said. Thanks. Okay, if all that works, even the parts where I'm speculating about the eggs and stuff, how do they, how do they get to LV426? And why are there xenomorphs after they appear in Alien vs. Predator? Huh? Ridley Scott me that. Woo! Nailed it. <laughs>